we'll start pretty general with some questions about health literacy and health and science communication. So um, whoever wants to take this one, but can you just talk generally, what exactly is health literacy? Well, if you read it in textbooks, health literacy is the ability to understand and use health information. But I see health literacy uh, in a much broader sense. I think helping people understand just how to navigate healthcare, how to understand their bodies, how to ask questions when they go to a healthcare provider or go to pick up their medicines at the pharmacy. So I think it's about um, how you can relate and understand and use the information that, that helps you to be healthier. So I don't think it's that it has to be as scientific as we see in the literature. Uh, we spend a lot of time with uh, ordinary people talking about their concerns. And so I like to think of health literacy in a much broader way. Okay. Um, so let's talk a little bit about health literacy in the US. So, so where are we at in regard to health literacy within the United States? And um, you know, after you answer that, what are some things that we can do to improve health literacy? I'll take I'll that. Take that. Yeah, <laughs> then I'll let Dr. Fitzpatrick go forward. Uh, so, you know, there's, as, as uh, Lisa said, there are a lot of different ways in which you can look at health literacy. And so how you say where we're at depends on which way you define it. We know that numeracy in the United States is abysmal. Honestly, even among physicians, we all do a really bad job of interpreting numbers, statistics, and risk. In terms of empowerment to take control of your health, that depends a lot both on your education, on your community, and on your relationship to your healthcare system. If you happen to have a great primary care provider or a great relationship with a community health worker, you may have terrific health literacy because people have spent the time to sit down and talk to you, even if you don't have a lot of formal education or comfort with numbers or stats or medical terms. On the other hand, Folks who are super educated or who come from a high socioeconomic status may still have low health literacy because they rely on online sources, on misinformation and myths, and or because they have poor relationships to their healthcare system. So where do we stand? It's a complicated question with a complicated answer that really depends on, on how you're defining it and, and what terms you're looking at. And I think that one of the things that both Lisa and I um, are motivated by is a desire to address problems with health literacy kind of across the population and to not let people assume that just because someone is minoritized, low socioeconomic status, low education, non-native English speaker, that they necessarily have low health literacy. It's not a foregone conclusion. If someone has low health literacy, it's likely because no one's really taken the time to sit down with them and explain what makes up health. And I would just add, uh, one of my friends who has an MBA reached out to ask me a question about their medical bill and was frustrated and said, I feel like I have to have a PhD to understand this. So I think just to reinforce the, the point Megan is making that the health literacy and the need to understand health information transcends um, all um, all classes, races, backgrounds. And so we have to recognize that this is really a universal problem. And the only other thing I would add is the healthcare system, providers in particular, because we are so, our attentions are so divided, don't often take the time to spend with, with patients. Or even when we go out into the community, we don't focus enough on ensuring our messages are simple enough so that they're conveyed in a way people understand. So I think there's also an onus on us to ensure we provide the information people need in a relatable way. So, so I guess in terms of um, meeting people within the healthcare system, uh, you know, at the doctor's office or, or um, practitioners that they interact with, what are some things that you think what are some interventions or, or changes that you think could happen? You want to go first this time? We can take sure, back and in forth. The, <laughs> in, well, in, so in the doctor's office, I think 
the the biggest thing we can do is listen. You know, there was a recent study that showed um, within the visit, the patient got to talk maybe 25% of the time. And it was the healthcare provider who was doing most of the talking. So we really need to listen and we need to be intentional uh, in the way we listen to make sure we are asking questions and ensuring um, the messages are getting through and that we are addressing uh, the, the concerns. Um, I've treated patients with HIV for a long time. And one thing I realized early in my career was that what was driving a lot of the concerns at the visits was fear. And once I realized that, the first thing I would say is, tell me what's scary. Let, let's talk about that first. Or I, in, for, in some cases, I would just say, I want you to know, now that you're here, you may have heard some terrible things. You're not going to die. You're here. And I think that helps open the door. So we have to be intuitive about what people need and want and give them the space in a non-judgmental way to ask the questions they need to ask. I will agree 150% with that, um, knowing that I also come from a slightly different perspective as an emergency physician rather than a primary care physician, but it is about establishing that trust and listening. The other thing that I'll add in the physician's office is that many of us think, well, if I just provide a brochure, kind of or a handout that I've somehow addressed health literacy, that is not sufficient. And there's lots of data and lots of studies looking at tools that do work. There are techniques like motivational interviewing or like decisional balance, doing decision support tools. There are a variety of different tools that we can use to help increase our patients and their caregivers or communities understanding of health problems and ability to have kind of self-efficacy in dealing with the health problems. The trouble is, is that we as providers rarely have that time. Right. There have been studies showing that for primary care providers, that if you guys did all of the screening and counseling that you were supposed to do, they would add like another eight hours onto your work day. That's just not sustainable. And so one of the areas that Lisa and I both work in is trying to find ways in which we can use technology to try to extend that relationship. So it doesn't, yes, the provider should be the primary source of trust, but then we can potentially use other tools to help us uh, enhance the health literacy of our patients in a way that isn't condescending or us just talking at them, but rather engages them with a question and answer session um, that respects their values, their life, and helps bring them to a point where they feel more in control and empowered um, to handle whatever health problems they're facing. And I'm glad you're bringing up the these digital solutions we're looking at because, you know, what we do at Grapevine Health, we create content, relatable content that can be pushed out to um, underserved communities. But one of the reasons we decided to do that is because we did a study to assess where people were getting information, information in general and health information. And it's not in the places we put it. So in the, in the case of the brochures, <laughs> most people are not, as, as Megan said, are not looking at those brochures, but guess what they are looking at? They're looking at their phone. Mm -hmm. They're watching YouTube videos, they're scrolling on Instagram and Facebook, and the health system is so far behind in meeting people in these places where they're already paying attention. We are terrible at, at um, collaborating with influencers who are already, uh, who've already captivated their attention. And so those are the kinds of um, measures we're trying to um, develop at Grapevine mm -hmm. Health because, you know, Nike knows how to sell shoes. Pepsi knows how to get people to drink their soda. Like, why hasn't the healthcare system figured out how to get people to think about their health in a different way? And I think it's because we need to move into the 21st century. We need to run into the 21st century <laughs> and figure out how what people care about and find ways for us to also show up collaboratively, collaboratively mm -hmm. in those places. Have you seen any health systems or um, any kind of other content in the world of social media that, uh, that does this well these days? Other than Grapevine Health? Other than, yes, of <laughs> course. <laughs> See, you didn't even pay me to say that, Lisa. <laughs> Good job. Seriously, that was so no. sweet. Go ahead. <laughs> 
I, so I think there are health systems who are trying, but I, I also think because the healthcare sector in general is very bureaucratic, uh, slow to change. Um, you know, we've been talking about systems transformation forever, but the first thing people will say is, well, what about the regulations? And we start talking about all the reasons we can't do things. And so this is the reason I think the innovation hasn't accelerated in health systems. But um, I don't want to call out any specific health systems because I know I will forget some, but I would just say that health systems are trying to uh, use things like apps. They're testing out different digital solutions. But for the population I'm focused on, which is largely Medicaid and underserved communities, the health innovations out there are just not being designed for these communities and they're not reaching the people we serve. So even though there are health systems who might even have digital innovation departments, uh, we're working with one right now, Providence St. Joe, I think they do a very good job thinking about digital health innovation, but the, the trick is to figure out how we can innovate for everybody and not leave any specific groups behind. Um, that's, that's the challenge and I think sometimes it's, because we let the, the regulatory barriers uh, cloud our judgment and, and it can be somewhat demotivating, I know, but I think there's a way to MacGyver this. <laughs> and I'll add on there that some of the, you know, so I've seen some really terrific solutions around a variety of really tough and sticky issues. Many are developed by people that aren't um, in private industry that are developing it as part of grants, foundation partnerships, federally funded grants, et cetera. Um, I've seen a bunch of small startup businesses that are doing really neat work. But some of the most exciting stuff that I've seen is outside of the healthcare system. So where I have seen the greatest success is where we in healthcare become aware that there are other resources out there and link our patients to those external resources. Um, Going off of Lisa's point about engaging influencers, about using uh, other popular platforms to provide education. And as much as we all uh, love to malign Facebook, I will say that their movement to help promote positive information about vaccine access and combating vaccine myths is an example of one way in which an existing company can do a lot to help combat misinformation and improve health literacy. It's a very small example, but it is one, and they have a tremendous platform and a lot of reach. And so, you know, the way to do this is by putting together all of those. And by those of us that are innovators off on the kind of around the edges or sometimes in the center, doing our best work to innovate and then sharing it with those larger platforms, whether they be health society or you know, healthcare institutions or systems, whether it be departments of health um, or whether it be um, kind of larger industry. The last thing that I will say is I did mention departments of health is that I do wanna give a particular shout out to um, New York City, to their uh, health system. They have done an excellent job, I think during COVID in modeling um, good communication with uh, populations. Um, Dr. Oni Blackstock in particular created a guide to safe sex during COVID-19 that I thought was just stellar. Not every piece of communication out of New York City health uh, has been stellar, but a lot of them have been more than you typically see. Um, and so I, there, there are examples as well, not just within healthcare systems, but within larger departments of health or public health systems too. Yeah, you mentioned um, Facebook getting involved in this space mm -hmm. around COVID-19. I just learned of um, YouTube has a PSA that they're running around vaccines and mm -hmm. safety. And um, so, you know, their traditional ad platform where you see a video after you watch um, another one, I guess they're embedding this PSA, which I think is a, a nice approach as well. Along with taking off those 30,000 frank videos that provided disinformation, the combination yeah. of the two kind of, it almost yeah. makes up for it, right? So yeah, yeah. good for them. Yeah. Um, okay. So we got a question. I think you talked a little bit about this, but maybe you can just add a, um, a bit more. Someone was, so we talked about, um, health literacy uh, in the clinical setting, but can you talk about how we can address health literacy from a public health um, perspective? Mm. So this is a great question and it's very timely. 
And it's because I've had people asking me, I, I, first of all, you heard you in my introduction, um, you, you mentioned I work for CDC. So I understand how CDC works. So people are calling me because they're second guessing the public health advice they might be getting from CDC, thinking it's too nebulous, um, it's confusing. Well, what about this situation? And I would just say the role of CDC is actually not to tell people what to do. It's not to mandate things. The role of the CDC is to offer guidance based on science. So when the recommendations come out, so in this case, mask wearing. So if you're vaccinated, you can take off your mask, but then it has some stipulations after that. And so people are a bit confused, but I think the challenge with public health communication is that science is ever evolving. Things are situational. So you, you may have a recommendation uh, that doesn't exactly fit the scenario. So you have to intuit and do your best to figure out what to do. And so I think, especially during the pandemic, it's been challenging because the information is constantly changing. Dynamic, we're in a dynamic situation. And so because the public is paying attention to science and public health for the first time uh -huh. in my memory, it's even, it's even more challenging because now that they're paying attention, we have a captive audience, but our message keeps changing. It's, it's a real hit to our credibility as communicators. And so I think we have to be careful and, and also just bring people along and help them understand. So if, you, if we give a, a guidance um, saying that you can, you can wear a mask or not wear, wear a mask under these circumstances, then help people understand how did you derive this recommendation? What are the limitations or I would say even just admitting that we don't have all the answers and we're doing the best we can. I think approaching our messaging with some humility is important. And I think we have lacked that throughout this pandemic. And then the final thing I'll say is I think a lot of the public health mess messengers are actually TV doctors. And so when you're speaking on television, you might have a very different form of our way of communicate, communicating information than let's say if Megan and I were having a conversation with a couple of people on the street. So trying to communicate messages broadly from the public health leadership, I think is just going to be challenge, challenging and sort of fraught with some confusion. But luckily there are people like us here who can help folks navigate the, uh, the confusion. I love that. So I, I want to kind of re-emphasize a couple of points that Lisa just said and then and extend on them. So I, I do think about this, the public health communication as there being the multiple levels. And I love that distinction about what the CDC's role is. I'll say that I've seen, you know, I mentioned um, New York, New York City. Um, I'll also say my home state of Rhode Island, um, Dr. Nicole Alexander Scott is our uh, director of the Department of Health in my state. And she has done an absolutely exemplary job um, during the pandemic of communication in a variety of ways. She has done, at the beginning, she did weekly press conferences where she and my governor stood up next to each other to communicate together. She used a variety of different forms of media. So there were the television press conferences, there was written media, there were Facebook Lives, there were social media posts. Um, the Department of Health engaged those of us in the state who had more public voices or who were trusted for one reason or another in doing uh, live events, in doing posts ourselves on various forms of social media. Um, and she created information that got disseminated through a wide variety of channels, including uh, health equity zones, which she had already established across the community and got disseminated in a variety of languages and translated in ways that recognize cultural literacy as well as linguistic literacy. So she kind of worked off of this existing infrastructure that she'd had for years to help communicate. So that's one example um, of great public health communication. 
Another one going off of Lisa's point around the TV doctors, as someone who's been fortunate enough to get to be on TV fairly frequently this year, it has been a fascinating experience for me. I am not normally a TV, like this was not my life plan. I am not Sanjay Gupta. It has been a joy and really interesting and fun, but it is a very different kind of communication and you don't have a lot of room for nuance. And so the way that I try to present things is in as simple, but also honest of a way as I can. And then I think it is important to follow it up with different kinds of media. So if we're doing public health communication, I can go on TV, but then I also should write something to follow it up because you're gonna miss the nuance. And to Lisa's point about nuance, I think that has been the very toughest thing. Everyone during this pandemic wants clear yes and no answers. And inevitably when we say yes or no, it, it doesn't work. There, there's nothing in public health that is 100% you know, yes and no. It's not like chocolate or vanilla choose there's some mix in between um and and communicating that is really challenging but also really necessary and and like things like the 15 minute rule um just drive me bonkers um and and we're not necessary in terms of our communication and i think that that's so to me kind of that last part is is that you know i i also have an administrative role within our school of public health and one of the things that we're trying hard to do is to include training around health communication for our students and for our faculty because um, I think that that's going to be an essential part of this as well as we move forwards is making sure that our next generation of healthcare leaders um, and public health leaders have the skill set to do what comes naturally to Lisa, but which doesn't come naturally to most people in this field. Um, and and but th there are great examples out there, and I think we could probably talk. The two of us could talk for an hour just on that topic alone. And I, you know, I would just say. Um... The, this coronavirus has brought all of us to our knees and we need yes. to have a level of humility, humility and respect for SARS-CoV-2. Mm -hmm. Because I can't tell you how many times I may have, you know, put something on Instagram or said something on Twitter and then I had to take it down. Yeah. The, mu the mutations are a great example. I remember posting something don't worry about the mutations because they're not making people sicker. They're not killing people and the vaccines all work. And almost the very next day <laughs> I had to take it down because the absolutes just don't work. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I will add as I was listening to Megan, I thought of this example. I was doing a uh, community listening session um, at a public housing community and I ask people where they get trusted health information when it comes to science and where, do they, where are they listening to information during the pandemic? And um, everyone was silent. And I said, well, what about CDC? And the lady says, oh, CDC who went from six feet to three feet, just like that. Mm -hmm. And this is a good example of what Megan's talking about. It feels very arbitrary to the public. Like you all aren't taking this seriously. You're, one day you're saying this and the next day, like where, how do you, you've been saying six feet for a year and now all of a sudden you're saying it doesn't make sense. So just wanted to share that as an example that, you know, this continues to humble me. Um, as a physician and epidemiologist and even a communicator, we have to be very, um, we have to have some deference for what's happening with this virus. Yeah. So how do you, you know, this is a, a big question, but how do you think we sort of meet people in the middle where it's like, we don't know everything, but here's what we do know. And, you know, it might change. So how do you kind of put all that together? Um, I think that's and still exactly and still what you trust. say. Yeah, <laughs> but I think that's exactly what you say, because people will respect you when you say that. Yeah. So I literally, honestly, I literally just had a piece that went live on CNN, like as we were starting this webinar, that says exactly that about the new mask <laughs> rule, where I was like, that people were like, how can we trust the CDC? And I was like, this is why the science says that what they're saying is safe, but PS expect it to change. Right, like I like very blatantly put that in there. Like, don't think this is the final word. It's going to continue to change, and here's why. Um, yeah. And and that's exactly it. That that we just, when we claim to know with certainty, 
I mean, I, I think I will also say from my viewpoint, um, it is such a uh, kind of, it is so antithetical to the way that I practice medicine, right? To be like, this is the one right way. It's hierarchical and patriarchal and it just implies this like doctor knows best, I'm better than you kind of thing, which is not the way the world works. Um, and sometimes we're wrong and then we get egg on our face. So I think it's much more, it, it's a much better practice to be honest and humble. I mean, you can listen to Brene Brown here and, and hold a little vulnerability. Um, and, and I think that it works even in public health messaging and helps people sometimes respect you more. Allowing people to make it to a certain degree. And then the nuance comes from you know, you want to allow people to, to have the space to make choices that make sense for them while also not letting them kind of fall prey to actual lies or, or you know, disinformation. And, and that becomes the, the line that I actually find far harder to walk is how to respect um, self-efficacy and the ability to make a choice while also making clear that some decisions there's super clear science that those decisions are unsafe and are not are, are, are unsafe to you and potentially unsafe to your community. And that's that's the um, balancing act that I think that is the difficult one right now with public health, given the volume of misinformation that's out there. I think the, a good example of this is the conversations we have around the, um, the vaccines and people who won't take a vaccine. Mm -hmm. Because part of the challenge is there's a lot of shaming going on uh, um, towards people who choose not to take a vaccine. And the way I approach this is, okay, fine. Because the truth is we don't need 100% of Americans to take a vaccine to get to herd immunity. We don't. But for those who won't take a vaccine, my position is, okay, that's fine. That's your choice. But there are other things you can do to stop the spread of coronavirus. And I remind them before we even thought we would have vaccines, we had a plan. This public health plan prevention mitigation strategy we're still talking about. So if you choose not to take the vaccine, you can still do something. And, and I think that is sort of the balance, the balance message, not shaming them for not want or for refusing the vaccine, but also empowering them and saying, but you can, you know, you still can help. We all have to do our part. And that seems to, uh, that seems to help um, address some of these, this tension uh, Megan raises. Yeah. Okay. Um, there's an interesting question that came in uh, in the chat here. So we've been talking a lot about health literacy um, among adults. Do you have any experience or can you talk about health literacy with children? Ooh, my favorite well, actually, topic. I, <laughs> yeah. I, I love that question. So this is why, you know, I'm so excited to talk to kids about their body because that's when we should be educating people because if we teach them when they're young, <coughs> then they can be influencers in their family. And as they um, move through, you know, middle, um, middle school, high school, and so on. And so I love talking to kids about health. And so Megan suggested that I'm very good at plain speak, but it, that didn't happen overnight. It takes some practice because it's a lot easier for me to have a conversation with, Meg, with Megan about immunogenicity and molecular strain typing, right? But if I have to explain it to my nieces and nephews, that forces me to think, oh, how can I make this make sense? And so I love the notion that we should be focusing on health literacy for kids. And maybe that's some sort of policy we should suggest to um, ACGME and places like that to incorporate that into training. I mean, I'm just thinking out loud here, but I think it's almost like learning a language. I took a Spanish class and it says if I were in kindergarten, that was the only way I could become proficient in learning Spanish. And I think it's the same thing with talking about health and the human body. So, but to answer the question, we don't do and we don't focus on it enough. 
uh, for a variety of reasons, and we should. Megan. So most of my research is actually on adolescent health and um, teen kind of empowerment around managing thoughts and emotions and behaviors and conflict resolution strategies. Um, and I think that one of the biggest things with kids is treating them, you know, especially the older children, once you're starting to get to age 12, 13 plus, is treating them like it's their body, right? Giving them respect, treating them in many ways like adults. Um, I agree with Lisa's point about presenting in plain language, but heck, we should be doing that for adults too. <laughs> um, and giving them the tools to both understand their body and to manage it. Uh, I, I think that for the vaccines that um, education of teens is going to be the critical part. And we just saw this week, Joe Rogan going on his bot podcast on Spotify, which has you know million plus listeners, and saying that although vaccines are safe, he wouldn't recommend them for age 21. There were a whole bunch of us that said, are you kidding me? We communicated with him. He's actually since said that he was wrong. But it was interesting is in, in the wake of that, many of us had discussions with the teens kind of in our lives and went out and kind of did some exploratory fact finding and found that the kids actually are hearing the messages and that many more kids are interested in getting the vaccine um, than their parents. And so, it, you know, empowering those kids to stand up for their own bodies and to stand up for taking care of themselves um, is one of the best things that we can do. The last thing that I'll say is that when we educate teens, right, we're not just empowering them for the moment, but we're empowering them for their lifetime. And it's why I think that so much of this work with them is so important. You know, we already talk about how kids are change makers in our society in general. I mean, it's always been that way that the younger generation is the one that pushes the older generations to change. I think we're seeing it particularly true right now around issues like climate change, and firearm injury and anti-racism. Um, so the education that we provide them at this moment will stick with them and help them make better choices both for themselves and for their eventual families um, as they grow older. So I just, uh, I, I love that question and I would love to see us dedicate far more resources um, to meeting kids where they're at and providing them the education in the medium that they find most important, which is actually the last thing that I meant to say. See, if I were doing this with prepared notes, I wouldn't have forgotten, but um, the, since it was a spontaneous question. So the last thing is, is that for kids in particular, uh, using social media is just so critical. You look at the degree to which kids have learned or been influenced by TikTok videos, by Instagram posts, um, by Snapchat to a lesser extent, although they use that less for educational pur purposes than the other two. Um, it is an absolutely critical uh, place to be. And I'll say we've done um, within my group, within my Center for Digital Health, we've done a number of programs around uh, cyber victimization prevention and improving resilience and mental well-being for youth during the COVID pandemic. And we have found that Instagram is just a wonderful place to be, that you capture kids who don't otherwise access the healthcare system. You capture kids who may not self-identify as needing help. Um, and, and have the chance to engage them in a place that feels comfortable and non-stigmatizing and accessible to them. Um, so I, there is so much opportunity out there um, for doing a better job of engaging our youth. I have a follow-up question for Megan about that though. Are they finding you? Or are you going to find them? Or, and how does that work? It's a great question. So we actually do ads. We do paid advertisements on Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, and we worked, we did a series of, um, kind of collaborative design sessions with teens to design the ads to make sure that the images and the language were ones that uh, were appropriate. And then we trialed a bunch of different strategies for what kind of ads were most likely to get click throughs. Um, so we do we do advertise act like active, but it's not super expensive, honestly. It's far cheaper than sitting in a clinic all day. I've actually compared, <laughs> we have a paper that just got accepted where I literally compared the costs of my having a staff member who sat in a clinic to offer the intervention to youth versus um, use doing it online and still including staff time for kind of having a conversation with a kid, which we will do like an online, we'll do a kind of remote conversation and then enroll them in an app. And it's cheaper for us, at least around this particular issue. And we get a much more diverse group of participants um, by, by doing it online only through social media. Wow.
That's really talk, we can talk another time about that, but yeah. That's really interesting. That lines up a lot with what we've been learning with recruitment for the Spark study is that um, we are very successful in recruiting through social media. And um, we also have people on the ground at various um, universities and uh, social media is very cost effective and, and you, re you can reach the people that you want to um, and it can diversify you know, the, the people that end up um, enrolling. Um, another question from the chat here is, uh, so we, we definitely have a, a health literacy problem in the US, but we also have a health equity problem. And so how can health literacy move the bar on health equity? Whoa, what a fantastic question. <laughs> yes, and something I think about a lot because, and I'm so glad whoever asked this question sees the intersection. Because I think we talk a lot about social determinants of health and, and we're usually talking about transportation, food, housing, um, job and economic support. But health literacy, I believe, is a very powerful driver of health outcomes. And so, and, and again, the, this is a bi-directional um, issue. So on the health system side, we need to be um, identifying interventions, quality metrics, things that will force us to improve people's health literacy to get them to a health out, a positive health outcome. And on the other side, on the community side, we need to prepare them or provide the resources they need to understand the information, but also understand how to interact with the healthcare system so that they're work, we're working together from both sides. So I think this intersection between health literacy and health equity is really critical and we need to be talking about it. But I think the, the reason we don't is because number one, we don't have a good metric. And a lot of times we're in the health, in the health system, we're always thinking about how things get paid. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those payments are linked to these metrics. And if we don't have a good metric for gauging whether or not someone's on a, you know, where someone is on a health literacy scale, and if that's linked to their outcome, then I think as long as we don't have that, it'll be hard for us to have these critical conversations about the link between health literacy and health equity. And it's actually something, actually, I just had a conversation with someone at CMS about this a couple of days ago. And I think they're skeptical that you could actually develop a quality met a good metric uh, to assess health literacy and also link it to some sort of reimbursement. But that's what has to happen because otherwise we're all just talking. I love that idea of a metric, Lisa, and I will totally support you in that. Like we'll talk offline and if I can help push that through, I think that's terrific. Um, the, the other thing that I will say though, is that you can provide, and I know this is like, this was the subtext I think behind what you were saying, but I want to say it out loud, which is that we can provide all of the empowerment and self-efficacy and health literacy interventions in the world. But if there are structural barriers to achieving health, if you live in an area that has been subject to redlining and you can't get safe or affordable housing, if you live in a food desert and there are no grocery stores near you. If you live in a neighborhood where there are lots of vacant garbage strewn lots or where all the street lights are broken. Um, if you live in an area where there are no sidewalks or where you're kind of right on a main road where cars are speeding and you're exposed to both pollution and your kids are at risk every time they try to go out and ride their bike or go for a walk. If, if there are those structural factors in place, all the health literacy interventions in the world are not going to create true health equity because you, you got to be able to afford fresh food and go for a walk and have a, some sort of green space nearby and have lights at night um, to reduce the risk of crime and stress and depression and obesity and that, you know, I could go on. So it, it is, there is a critical link. Um, it is necessary, but not sufficient. But it needs to be recognized as a social driver, just like the others. Agreed. Because it's also linked to distrust of the healthcare system. So these things are interrelated. So if you have someone, and I had someone say to me, if I don't understand what you're saying, I don't trust you. Mm. So 
So think about that. How many how many people go and see a healthcare provider and they're nodding and or just sort of eyes are glazed over because they don't understand what's happening and they don't ask a question. Will they go pick up their medication at the pharmacy after that? Will they see value in coming back for a visit? And so I think we need to think more holistically about how all these things relate together. All the factors Megan just talked about, but also recognizing our responsibility to make sure people uh, understand what we're saying to them. I love that. I, I just, there's this thing that we always talk about in medicine for those who aren't in healthcare on the call, which is like the doorknob moment, right? So yes. we're about to walk out the door, our hand is on the doorknob, and the real reason for the patient's visit comes up. They go, oh, doc, there's one more thing. And then you're like, oh, now I understand why you're here, right? And I tell my residents, my trainees to always be ready for that, but also to me, so you, you don't wanna shut down that possibility, but a really great physician is gonna create a space for that conversation to happen before you get to the doorknob, right? That they're gonna figure out that there's something missing and create a safe space for that conversation earlier, which gets back to that health literacy and that trust. And you know, if, if that doorknob no, moment never happens, that patient's never gonna be able to achieve health. So. I really appreciate that point, Lisa, thank you. So we're talking a lot about, you know, the clinic and working with doctors. Can you, can you elaborate on any interesting approaches that either you've done or that you've seen where um, the community is involved? So, you know, there's, there's trust within your, your peers. So can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I, I'll, I'll let, um, you want to go first on this, Megan, or? Sure. Yeah, I'll go first and then I'll let you weigh in. I mean, there, there are so many, so many of the most successful um, health education and health literacy uh, efforts that I've seen have been led by community members. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a lot of great stuff out there right now. We're actually working at Brown. Um, we're working with an organization called Pink Corn Rose. Um, that has a program um, to create media messages with uh, community-based organizations in seven communities um, nationwide to, do, to work on uh, vaccine um, uh, confidence. So it's an example, this the group called Pink Cornrows is kind of working to develop messages internally um, with CBOs. So that's one example. Um, there's another example. Um, there's a group in Philly, um, a Black Doctors Alliance that has worked to create information and outreach around um, vaccine access. Um, there's some amazing work that I've seen done around violence prevention. I sit on the board of a group here in Rhode Island called the Nonviolence Institute, which is based off of the teachings of Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, et cetera, and kind of this idea of, of living a life of nonviolence and works to try to stop the retaliatory cycle of violence in our community. They have done unbelievable work in terms of health literacy and outreach, not just around violence prevention, but also around a variety of other health issues um, in the community that they work in. So there are so many. And I think to me, that's part of our job as public health directors or agencies or as physicians is to find the community-based organizations that we can work with and support. Our job is not to swoop in and be the solution, but rather to serve as the support to help make sure that the message is getting out that is accurate and then amplifying the incredible work of our community partners who are there day in and day out um, for the people around them. I don't, wow, I can't add too much to that. I think um, that's all spot on. I would just say we need to do a better job. We in the health sector need to do a better job collaborating across these sectors, Megan mentioned, because there are so many opportunities. We talked about captive audiences on social media, but within these peer groups, she's talking about you know the um, returning citizen community or the violence interrupter groups. There is not enough connection between um, health influencers or, or even healthcare providers or system leaders going into the community to work side by side with those groups to figure out where the opportunities are to embed health messages or even look for opportunities to improve uh, prevention, wellness um, behavior. So I think there's still a lot of opportunity that is untapped. And so 
And I'm really glad you, you raised these issues, uh, Megan, because it's motivating me to even double down to make sure that we're being as comprehensive as we need to be to collaborate with those folks because they've already built the trust in the community and they are the trusted messenger. So we need to arm those, the leaders of those sectors with this information. It doesn't always have to be us. We've seen that during the pandemic, the messages are coming from other non-clinical people. We just need to make sure they're armed with the right information. And I think the challenge there, Lisa, right? I mean, I, I fully admit the challenge is two things. One is, well, there's three. There's comfort, which hopefully we can get over. There's time, yeah. right? And then there's funding. And, and the time and the funding are the tough ones to fix um, because to work respectfully with a community-based organization, it's not like you can kind of drop in and drop out and, and it does take a true investment of time. And then the funding issue is real, particularly for them. Most of them are nonprofits that you know don't have a lot of kind of discretionary um, communications people or whatever. And uh, those have been kind of my experience of where the barriers have been. Um, but step one is, is the acts, you know, us reaching out and saying we're here and, and we're happy to help and, and would love to create a trusted relationship. So, yeah. So we can make that one of our calls to action because, you know, during the pandemic, so many foundations stepped up and said, uh, you know, this is our declaration for what we're going to do to improve um, health equity, or we're going to reduce um, you know, the, these disparities we're seeing, they're intolerable and all of these inflammatory words, but then you sit down to write a grant to get a million dollars for these organizations. And there's a whole list, of, a long list of reasons you're either not eligible or you don't have the infrastructure and so on. And so I think that is a, a terrific point you're making. And we should make that one of our um, clarion calls for this conversation. So if there are that. foundations listening to this, um, <laughs> I think they have to put their money where their mouth is. If you want to help, we can't continue to fund in the way we have in the past because we can't get the outcomes we need if we do. Yeah. And I'll, I'll actually put in one more plug there, Lisa, because that's a great point. And the other one is, is for private companies. And I will say some of our, my, the, so, you know, as, as um, you guys mentioned during the beginning, Vincent, I'm um, one of the organizations that I've worked closely with over the, well, help create and have obviously continued to work closely with over the course of the pandemic is a group called Get Us PPE. Um, it was a bunch of physicians who came together and said, we need to get ourselves personal protective equipment because no one else is getting it for us. Um, and in our work, I will say that one of the things that has driven our success and our ability to work with community-based organizations has been partnership with private industry. Um, folks, whether it is 3PL shipping companies, whether it is mask manufacturers or gown manufacturers, uh, whether it's other industry partners that have provided um, either uh, in-kind or monetary donations, or donations of like concepts. Like we had people from some of the large tech companies that allowed their employees to volunteer with us to help create our databases. Um, those types of, of, of kind of real um, on the ground support and collaborative innovation and commitment from private industry is equally critical as well. Um, because there are times where private companies know a lot more, move a lot faster, um, mm -hmm. have a lot, bigger skill set than those of us either in the healthcare or academic community or folks who work primarily um, in the community-based organization space. So I want to put that plug out as well, is for kind of that private public partnership um, to continue and amplify. I saw great examples of it during COVID. And I've seen great examples of it pre-COVID as well, but I saw a lot more over the last year than I had previously. Desperate times call for desperate measures. <laughs> Truth. Um, let's take another question from the Q&A here. Um, so we've seen a lot of misinformation being spread um, during this time. And so do you have any tips to help your patients discern between misinformation and what's coming from a trusted source and good info? Yeah, you know, I think this, this is one of my disappointments for Grapevine Health during the pandemic, and that is really taking the time to help people understand how to deconstruct the information. 
And generally what hap what I've noticed, there, there are some patterns I've noticed. Um, and this is what I tell people when they ask me. Um, I saw this article came out and here's what it said. So in the same way I was mentioning people are finally paying attention, like they're a captive audience, we should also give them some sort of rubric so that they can assess what's real and what's not and what they should actually be looking for when they're reading things online, particularly these published studies that haven't been peer reviewed. Mm. So, you know, that's a whole nother conversation about whether or not that's good or bad. I, you know, I have a, a lot of thoughts about that, but particularly in the articles that are not peer reviewed, helping people understand this is the way this article is structured and here's where you need to look to determine if you should pay attention to this and if it's real information you can hang your hat on. The other thing I see is usually a, a, a personality, radio personality or someone who's a social media influencer saying, well, I heard from my good friend whose father was a sci you know, eminent scientist at Johns Hopkins and his name was so-and-so. And he said, like, that's always a red flag for me because if you peel the onion, and I, I did this a lot during the beginning of the pandemic, there were stories going around about the association between, I think it was ibuprofen and COVID-19. And there was so much misinformation. You shouldn't take this and you shouldn't take that. And so when I tried to get to the root of some of these stories, I always came up empty. This person doesn't even exist. Or if they do exist, they work at an organization that has nothing to do with science. And so I think the problem with the misinformation on um, online and on social media is that it is coming so fast and and there's so much of it. And if it sounds credible, yeah. people will pass it on because they are too busy scrolling and trying to bring in information that they don't take the time to verify if something is true. And so it's a really, really challenging um, problem. Megan, how, how do you deal with this? I, I'm with you that this, this to me is actually one of our big tasks for the next year or two. Uh, as a medical and public health community and as public health communicators. And I think it's a few things. One is we need to flood the airwaves with true stuff instead of yeah. letting the baloney kind of be out there. There's just, I, I think we've seeded the discussion for too long to people that are spreading misinformation and we need to be just as good and just as talented at creating media messaging that goes viral and we need to be consistent uh, about doing it. That's the Which first Which takes part. money. Which like takes money. Yeah, it's going back to that basic theme. Totally true. It takes money and expertise. Um, the the second thing is, is that I do tell people to look, like you said, to look at the source. Um, who's saying it? Is it someone who has a history of saying things that are trustworthy? Um, I tend to tell people it may be a politician or a media person who I normally agree with, but just like you, I, I, I don't usually tell people to get their advice from politicians or from media figures. Uh, unless they're doing it in conjunction with a trusted um, physician or healthcare professional. The toughest part for me is, you know, in general, I tell people to try to listen to folks who come from the healthcare or science world, but not everyone within our world is trustworthy either. And I don't want to call out names on this webinar, but Lisa and I can probably both come up with five names off the top of our heads of people who have been part of the problem with spreading misinformation around vaccines in general, around COVID, around other common healthcare issues. Um, I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, and, 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 and so that, that's where it really gets tougher. Um, ideally, the CDC is that source of trusted information for our country, but unfortunately, uh, it, it lost a lot of its trust last year. And I think we're gonna have a ways to go until that is regained. And in the meantime, those of us who are out there in the public health space, just, we have to be, louder and more persistent um, than the others. So, but the last and, thing that I'll say is that I do tell people to go, the last thing is to go to a trusted news aggregator. So something like WebMD or Medscape or Stat News um, are, are places that you can trust that they do some sort of fact checking and publish truth rather than like a random internet website 
that claims to have the latest cure for, you know, dandruff or body odor or kind of whatever, I wouldn't, th those are not the sites that I would go to. <laughs> so. But I really appreciate you, um, you hold, you holding all of us accountable for also putting, as I call it, we need to put accurate information on the grapevine to counter it, counteract the misinformation because that's how it, it's allowed to flourish. And I'm guilty as well because it takes a lot of energy and time to make videos and get on social media. And, and you know, mm -hmm. now in this, this, in the beginning of the pandemic, in the beginning, <laughs> the beginning of the pandemic, nobody cared what you look like on social media. <laughs> But now you have to make sure your hair is combed and you look fabulous, right? So it, got the lipstick. there's a process. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, but I appreciate in all seriousness, thank you very much for reminding me because we need to, we really need to do a better job at Grapevine even, me included, getting on these social media channels and helping people understand this information, what's true and what's not. Well, Lisa, I would say there that we're a team and that none of us can do this alone, that we all <laughs> lift each other up and fill in little pieces and yeah. goodness. Yeah. There's no single one of us that's going to, that's going to have fix to it. do our part though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great point. Um, okay. Let's just do one more question here. Um, something a little more future thinking. So um, what's something that you're excited about or um, hopeful about, you know, we've learned a lot during the pandemic? Um. I'm hopeful that uh, we will get enough people vaccinated and we can take off our masks eventually and meet in person again. I am not a fan. I say this on every webinar. I am not a fan of being on Zoom. <sighs> and I think it's also not great for our mental health. We were gonna talk a little bit about that. One of the things I'm doing for my mental health is I'm minimizing my Zoom conversations and either going outside for a walk or even meeting with someone in person who's also been vaccinated. So um, I'm hopeful that we, we are now on the tail end of this pandemic and it will be sustained. And Megan, we still didn't have our conversation about whether or not coronavirus will become endemic or if we're done. <laughs> we'll have that. That's not a hopeful end. That's the other thing I'm hopeful. I'm also hopeful that we're done with this coronavirus. <laughs> mm, I won't go there. I, I think it's endemic, but, uh, but, but, but yeah. So where am I hopeful? So everything Lisa said, and the other thing that I'm really hopeful about is that we're going to have a new wave of enthusiasm and commitment to public health and particularly to public health messaging. And I think if we take nothing else out of this pandemic, it is going to be the importance of investment in public health infrastructure and the importance of us creating really great public health communication mechanisms to take us forward into the rest of this next century. And I am just so excited to get to help lead that along with people like Lisa and folks like you guys at the Simons Foundation. I think that to me, that is, that is the thing that will provide resilience. And that's like the future shock proof, right? Is, is, is that communication and infrastructure so that we don't get caught unprepared the next time.